last number of weeks together, we've been studying God's Word and asking the Holy Spirit to help us to grow as worshipers of our awesome God. The Westminster Confession declares that the chief end of man, that's people, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Yes, as the video piece noted, every breath that we breathe is given to us by our God so that we might worship Him. Obviously, then, worship isn't an event or a moment. It's really a lifestyle. And we want to talk from God's Word this morning about a very significant aspect of the lifestyle that is worship. And that significant aspect of worship is this. It's serving. Friends, when we serve others, we serve God. When we bless others, we bless our God. When as followers of Jesus, we give ourselves to the Spirit of God that we might be Christ's hands, feet, and voice to others. That brings much glory to our God. And this is a truth that scriptures consistently convey. And so, for example, in James chapter 1 and and verse 27, God's word says this, religion that our God and Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. In other words, the worshiper who's the real deal before the living God is the person who will demonstrate the love, the compassion, the heart of the Lord Jesus to people who were hurting and vulnerable. In the same vein, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11, God's word says, Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. When we use our strength as followers of Jesus, our gifts, our abilities, our resources, to come alongside others and bless them and serve them and be to them Jesus' hands and feet, we are living in that very act of service a statement of worship that brings much honor to God. This is one of the things that I love about Harvest, one of many things, things for which I'm thankful to God. One of them is this. It's the way in which the Spirit of God continues to work in our lives and in our midst to encourage us and strengthen us to serve. And again, as we serve and bless people, we serve and bless our God. I want to direct our attention now to that very poignant passage of Scripture that Aaron read a moment ago. And it's the foot washing passage in John chapter 13. Again, page 751 in the church Bibles. And in this passage of Scripture, our Lord Jesus, as he did on that night for his disciples, provides us with this incredible example of serving and blessing others. And again, when we bless people In Jesus' name, we bless the heart of our Father. So let's unfold together this passage of Scripture with that thought in mind. How can we grow in terms of blessing others so that we bless and worship God by living a very real lifestyle of worship before our Father? Look, first of all, to verse 1 where we see the significance of serving. And the question I ask is this. How big a deal is it to worship God by serving others? Look at verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end or to the uttermost. So as John chapter 13 opens up, and in that first verse, get this. Jesus our Lord is less than 12 hours away from willingly giving himself to a horrifying and humiliating death on the cross of Calvary to pay for the sins of the world, to pay for your sins and for mine. He's less than 12 hours away from that moment. And yet in those final emotional hours, what does he choose to do? Having gathered his disciples together to share that Passover meal with them after supper, 
he is going to demonstrate to them the significance of serving and blessing others by modeling that very dynamic to his own disciples. Surely, this aspect of our worship then has to be huge so far as the heart of our Father in heaven is concerned because, again, Jesus lived out a model of serving others in his very final hours in his earthly life and ministry before he would go to the cross of Calvary. What a significant aspect of living a lifestyle of worship for us as followers followers of Jesus is this truth then of asking God's spirit for grace and strength that we might live lives of blessing toward others. That tiny Albanian nun who embodied selfless service, Mother Teresa, she once said, not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. Friends, every one of us has opportunity or opportunities to come alongside other people, maybe in our own household, in our neighborhood, here within our church family, where it is that we work, Every one of us has opportunities to come alongside people and encourage them and affirm them and bless them and help them and strengthen them. And when we do so, in Jesus' name and in his love, every such act of blessing people blesses our Father. When we serve people, we serve God. That's a powerful statement of worship. We'll look now to verses 2 to 5, where, having noted the significance of serving, and it has to be significant. Jesus did it in his final hours. He modeled that for us. Now in verses 2 to 5, we see the priority of people. And obviously, it's a fairly evident truth, but profound nonetheless. When we're talking about living a lifestyle of serving, as expressive of a lifestyle of worship, we're talking about people. We're talking about blessing and coming alongside people. And Jesus surely did that that evening. Verse 2. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So on that evening, as Jesus and his closest friends gathered together to celebrate the Last Supper, the Passover meal, following the meal, Jesus took a towel around his waist and he began to serve his disciples by washing their feet. Jesus reached out to and served and blessed people. And all of his disciples were there that evening. When we're talking about serving, living a lifestyle of blessing that blesses and brings glory to God, we are talking about tangibly coming alongside and reaching out to bless Real people. The real people that God, in one way or another, has placed in our lives. Author and speaker, Christopher DeVink, in his book, The Power of the Powerless, gives an account of the birth and life of his brother, Oliver. Oliver passed away when he was not quite 33 years of age. And for Oliver's entire life, he lived lying on his back in a corner of his bedroom, right by the window in that bedroom. And that's because Oliver was blind and mute, and Oliver was unable to lift his head. And because of some severe cognitive difficulties, Oliver had no capacity to learn. As Christopher grew older, in time, vocationally, oh, there's some pictures. There's uh, Christopher giving Oliver a kiss when they were very little, and then they're a little bit older in the second picture. 
In time, Christopher vocationally would become an English teacher. And one day, in terms of challenging his students to serve others, he told the story of his younger brother, Oliver. Oliver passed away in 1980 at nearly 33 years of age. And after telling the story, one of the students put his hand up at the back of the room, and they said, oh, Mr. DeVink, you mean that Oliver was a vegetable? And in his writings, Christopher admits that he stammered for a few seconds. He wasn't sure how to respond to that. And finally, he said, yeah, I suppose you could say that he was a vegetable, but I called him Oliver. He was my brother, and I think that you would have loved him. So what was Oliver's story? When Oliver came into the world for his mom and dad, he looked like he was a very healthy, regular, normal baby boy. But a moment, a couple months later, gave mama the first inclination that her little boy was struggling with some very serious difficulties. As she cradled him, she went over to the window and held him in the sunlight, and Oliver gazed wide-eyed directly into the sunlight. And that was the first inclination that mama had, that her little boy was blind. In the days to come, a battery of tests ensued. And finally, the physician came to mom and dad to tell them that Oliver's condition was very serious indeed. There was nothing medically that could be done to help Oliver. And the doctor suggested that they might want to commit Oliver to institutional care. At which point, mom and dad said, no, we won't be doing that. He's our son. We'll take Oliver home, of course. The doctor said, well, then take him home and love him. Again, Oliver would grow to be nearly 33 years of age. Stature-wise, he'd grow to be the size of about a 10-year-old with a head that was large and disproportionately sized for the rest of his body. His family would bathe him, change his diapers. They'd tickle his chest, and he would giggle. They would feed him every day. And then... Christopher recalls the time in his early 20s that he met a young lady that he thought he was in love with. And the big moment came to bring her home to meet the family. He told her about Oliver. So when they got to the household, he asked her if she wanted to meet Oliver. And she said, no, thank you. Sometime after that, Christopher met another young lady, Rowie. And the same moment came the chance for him to bring her home to meet the family. And this time he was nervous about how the Oliver thing would go over. So because it was his time to feed his younger brother, he asked her, would you like to come with me? And she said, sure. And she watched as Christopher very gently, lovingly, fed his younger brother one spoonful at a time. And after a bit, she said, hey, can I try that? And then, with an ease, and with a poise, and with the compassion, she took the spoon and proceeded to finish feeding Oliver his meal. Christopher concludes his piece by asking this question. Now, which girl do you suppose I married? <laughs> he married Rowie. They have three children themselves. I read that story, and that grabs my heart incredibly hugely. It reminds me of a lot of things. It reminds me, first of all, that all people, and I underscore all people, matter to God and are precious to God. Amen? All people. And as followers of the Lord Jesus, when we come alongside and serve and value and love in Jesus' name, people who are image bearers of Almighty God, that is a powerful statement of worship that brings much honor and glory to the Lord our God. Amen? Amen? By the way, did you notice one of the people at the supper that night in the verses that we just read who's actually noted by name? Yeah, that somebody was Judas the betrayer. And in his omniscience, the Lord Jesus knew full well what Judas was up to. But did Christ tip his hand? Turn some of those other guys, maybe the Apostle Peter, after that Judas guy? No. Nope. What Jesus did that night is he loved and washed Judas's feet as well. Is that not profound? 
Friends, as we seek to live a lifestyle of worship by serving and blessing people and coming alongside them and tangibly meeting their needs in Jesus' name, there are lots of times that that will be a joy and there are times when that will be hard and difficult because sometimes, at some level, like Judas, the people that we're called to serve will not be so lovable. But you know what? We're all fallen sinners, are we not? I can have my unlovable moments myself. We're called... Regardless, in Jesus' name is our Lord model for us to come alongside and serve people and bless them. So right now, what person is the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind? Maybe it's even an extra grace-required person, a challenging person, but someone that God would be saying to you right now, this is your chance to live a lifestyle of worship by reaching out to that person and tangibly demonstrating the love of God. Who's that person? Again, when we bless people, we bless God. All right, come back now to verses 3 and 4, and let's talk about the impact of the insignificant. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Now let's talk to the setup for that very poignant moment. In that culture, because the roads were uh, dusty, and especially following a rain, it was mucky, and everybody was wearing those sandals, and everyone's feet got very dirty. So it was super customary for the host of a dinner party to provide a servant who would wash the feet of all the dinner guests who would arrive. Now, if a household was of modest means so that they couldn't afford a servant for that specific task, then it was also customary for one of the early guests to arrive at the dinner party to willingly take this role upon themselves. So what didn't happen that night? None of the disciples volunteered for this job. I envision them looking at each other and why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? No thanks, you do it. None of them took on that role. Though they well understood the custom of the day. So at that dinner party that evening, there were a bunch of guys with dirty feet and pride-filled hearts. Following the meal then, as John has just told us, the Son of God, knowing full well that he was the CEO of the universe, very quietly and unannounced, got up from the dinner table and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he filled a basin with water. And he began to wash his friend's feet. Friends, does that statement of profound humility and love and a heart to serve others not grab our hearts? That's God doing that. That's awesome. But the other side to that might be this. The cynic would perhaps look at it and say, okay, I can buy all of that, but are you kidding me? Jesus, in your final hours on planet Earth, that's not exactly the best bang for your buck. I mean, washing the dirty feet of a few guys in private? Surely you could have done better than that if you wanted to go out with some kind of a statement. And we would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. There are all kinds of things being communicated in this moment as Jesus took on the role of humble servant washing his disciples' feet. But one of those statements has got to be this. It's the impact of the insignificant. Does not our God love to take the ordinary and through the ordinary do the extraordinary? When we offer to the Lord our God even the simplest acts of service done in Jesus' name and in his love, make no mistake, that's a powerful statement of worship 
And that's something that God uses in mighty ways to bring his blessing into the lives of people. Is this not the truth? Yes, it is. Jesus was showing his friends that night, hey, don't demean anything that you would do for someone else to serve and bless them. Never look down on it. Because when the smallest thing washing somebody's feet is done in Jesus' name, in God's economy, that's a big deal. Because that's worship. Because God loves to take our smallish things, the things that are not, as the Apostle Paul would say, and use them to bless others and bring to his name great honor and glory. Billy Graham loved to tell the story of an 80-year-old grandma who was blind and she was confined to her home. And she had a talk with God one day where she said, Lord, I've followed you for most of my life and I'm blind, there's nothing I can do now. Just take me home. And she had the distinct impression that God said to her, no, there is something for you to do yet. I'm not finished with you here on this earth. And with that, Grandma's memory was jogged, and she realized that she had a copy of a Braille phone book. So that day, starting with the A's and working her way to the back, she started phoning people every day, people that she'd never met, to simply tell them that Jesus loved them. Nine years later, when she was 89 years old, that grandma by that simple act of service and blessing in the lives of others as unto the Lord her God, had been used by the Holy Spirit to point more than 3,000 people to Jesus. Our God loves to come alongside us as we give our lives to him in worship by blessing others. Yeah, he loves to come alongside us, take those seemingly smallish things that we would do and use them to bring encouragement and strength into the lives of others and to greatly exalt his name. Well, the passage of Scripture concludes beginning with the sixth verse and right through to 17 uh, with this. And in it all, there is a principle to practice. And that's where these verses go to. Jesus brings it right around to his guys and calling them to obey what it was he had modeled them for, modeled before them. Verse 6. He, Jesus, came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Honestly, can you imagine how awkward this had become following dinner? I'm guessing by now that room was super quiet. And there were a lot of sheepish disciples sitting around the dinner table. They knew what the culture of the day was. And here, God incarnate was walking from person to person and washing their feet. And when it came Peter's turn, he asked the question, Hey, wait a minute. Jesus, are you going to wash my feet? Verse 7, Jesus replied, You don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you're clean, though not every one of you. For he knew it was going to betray him. That was why he said not everyone was clean. When Jesus came to Peter, he said, No, Lord, that is not going to happen right here, right now. Oops, Peter. Oops. Guess what? We don't get to tell God what to do. Jesus rebuked Peter and said, If you're going to know spiritual intimacy with me in this moment, Peter, you're going to have to humble yourself and receive what it is that I'm going to do for you. And then in characteristic Peter fashion, he super impetuously responded with, well, then give me a whole bath, Jesus. And Jesus said, Peter, you don't need a bath. Peter was already a follower of Christ by faith. What he needed to do in that moment was obey his Lord so that he could experience spiritual intimacy with Jesus in that very moment. Now pick it up with verse 7. 
Pardon me, verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus has washed everybody's feet. And what did Jesus not do? He didn't turn around and say, now would somebody please wash my feet? He didn't do that. I mean, that would have been easy. Who wouldn't have volunteered for that in that moment? Anybody would have done that. And, I mean, especially given the embarrassment and the chagrin in that room by that point. But he didn't say that. Oh, no, he said, now that I have served you and blessed you in this way, as an example, I want you to serve and bless other people in the manner of which I have demonstrated for you. Friends, in life, in following the Lord Jesus, it always comes down to loving him by owning what he asks us to do in obedience. And this was crunch time for the disciples. This scene makes me think of a story recounted by Mark Twain. On one occasion, a ruthless business person, a wealthy individual, was going on and on about how on his bucket list he wanted to travel to the Holy Land and climb to the top of Mount Sinai and stand up there and read out loud the Ten Commandments. And Mark Twain shot back, I got a better idea. Why don't you stay in Boston and keep them? It always comes down to doing what God wants us to do, right? So this was the challenge that Jesus put before his disciples. And get this. As they chose to honor their God and Father and bring glory to the Lord by living a life of service and blessing towards others, even as Jesus had demonstrated for them, they, Jesus said in verse 17, would be blessed. The word speaks of authentic happiness, a deep-seated joy. Friends, is there a greater joy that we can experience in life than the exciting reality of knowing that we have partnered with the Lord Jesus in mission to bring glory to God and to minister his love and his hope and his encouragement into the life of another, that, my friends, is a great joy. In 250 AD, in the North African city of Carthage, there was a group of Jesus followers that came to be known as the gamblers. That's because they were doing something in that city that no one else was doing. A plague had descended upon Carthage, and people were sick and infectious and dying. And so these followers of Jesus, they rolled the dice with their lives. And they went into that city and they came alongside the sick and infectious people and they ministered to the dying and they buried the dead, something no one else was doing. And many of the citizens of Carthage, they hated these believers because of the very fact that they were followers of Christ. And yet they did that. And because they were willing, as the populace viewed it, to roll the dice with their lives and gamble their lives in that way, they came to be known as the gamblers. May God's Holy Spirit embolden us to live lives of worship before the Lord our God by gambling for the kingdom through selfless acts of service in Jesus' name, that we would continue to pour into the lives of others. And everybody said, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you in humility and in gratitude this morning. The passage of Scripture 
authored by John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit just grabs our heart. To think that Almighty God, the incarnate Son of God, would demonstrate such a humble servant heart on that evening. And then challenge us, call us, invite us to be on mission with him by doing the same. You are an incredibly gracious God, and we exalt and worship you with our lips and our hearts today. And how we look forward in the days to come, this day and this week, at the opportunities we're going to have together in our households and individually to worship the Lord our God and lift up his name, Jesus, by being your hands and feet to a lot of people. Thank you for the things you're going to do through us. We pray in Jesus' mighty name and for his honor and glory. Amen.